Okay, everybody. If you could, uh, uh, if, if you could settle down, that'd be great, and we can get on with this uh, evening's uh, proceedings, uh, which have the grand title but important title of militarization responses to transnational uh, organized crime. We've got a terrific set of speakers here with you uh, this evening. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Professor Michael Cox. I'm director, not chair. It's nice to have a chair, but I'm director of LSE uh, Ideas, and I'm sometimes called Emeritus Professor, which I think means you're dead, but maybe <laughs> not. Uh, distinguished, I think, is the word they're looking for. Uh, but anyway, it's great to have this uh, meeting here this evening, organized by a number of people I know particularly uh, Dr. John Collins, with whom I worked for many years inside uh, LSE Ideas before his great program on drugs came over to, to the U.S. Centre. Um, the deployment of armies, uh, military assets, and militarised approaches can send a powerful message in terms of dealing with crime, war on drugs and all the rest, but let's be honest, has it worked and has it made the situation worse? Those are the questions. And this debate co-hosted between the LSE US Center and also would, would welcome enormously to the school the Global Initiative against uh, transnationalized organized crime. You're very much welcome here this evening, as indeed is Misha. We'll discuss four different areas of criminality. Uh, wildlife crime, uh, piracy, human smuggling and drug trafficking. If you could throw in the Paradise Papers as well, I'd also be very welcome to hear about that, but perhaps that's not crime. We'll see how effective a militarised response can really be and why, what might be lost in the process. Our first speaker, and it's in a sense a game of two halves, Misha Glenny, who I'm sure is well known to many of you, but I'll say a few words about Misha in a moment. I just said, by the way, Misha, you're very young, but I actually knew your father, as they say, being an old Sovietologist myself. Uh, but Misha will begin uh, and speak for about 15 minutes. After he's spoken, there won't be any Q&A at that point, by the way, and then we'll go over to a round table uh, chaired over there uh, by Tuesday Raitano, who's one of the editors, by the way, of this book, which is called Militarised Response Responses to Transnationalised Organised Crime. Because it's published by Palgrave, of course, it comes in at about 130 quid. But nonetheless, if you want to order it on demand, you can certainly get it. But congratulations on the book. Uh, perhaps you should choose a better publisher next time and we'll produce it a lot more cheaply. But well done anyway. I know, I know, I know, I know Power Gray particularly well, don't worry. Um, anyway, it's terrific. It's a terrific session we're going to have here this evening talking about what I think is one of the great, the great challenges of our age on the war on crime, so called. Uh, Misha, it's terrific having you this evening. I, I've read many, most, if not nearly all, of your books over time. I started off with your book on the fall of Yugoslavia and and your work on the Balkans, which you were greatly interested in, I know. Uh, but over the years, out of that, of course, I think, did, not, did it not follow, not logically, but it certainly followed in terms of your own work, to start looking at the relationship between disintegration in Eastern Europe, former Yugoslavia, and the rise of new forms, or so we thought, of new organised form of crime, of a more systematic, more deadly, and indeed more effective, and more internationally significant character. Amisha has published many books, McMafia, wonderfully titled thing, by the way, Seriously Organised Crime, Dark Market, How Hackers Became the New Mafia, The Rebirth of History, and many, many works before. So Misha, as I say, will speak for about 15 minutes on the broad theme of this evening's lecture, Militarisation and War on Crime. He'll then finish, and then we'll hand over to Tuesday. So I wonder if you could give a proper and full, fulsome LSE welcome to Misha Glenny. Please, Misha. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you because I'm not going to talk, uh, strictly speaking, about the militarization issue because we're going to discuss that in the panel. Uh, instead, I want to talk about uh, various aspects emerging from my work, and um, particularly the book um, uh, McMafia, which I first published here in the United Kingdom about a decade ago. And if you'll forgive me a moment of self-indulgent, I can't hide my excitement that next year we'll see a major eight-part television drama based on the book, McMafia, uh, 
co-produced by the BBC and the AMC in the US, and it's going to be broadcast around the world on Amazon's platform as well. Now, I was particularly pleased with the uh, collaboration I had on this project with the writer on the series, Hossamini, and its director, James Watkins. Uh, we've collaborated very closely from the start in order to ensure that this drama will be as authentic a reflection of the real world uh, as possible. I've uh, long believed that while books remain a tremendously valuable resource for public policy, if we're going to meet the challenge posed by um, a whole range of global and regional security threats, then we need as broad a public understanding of them as possible. And nowadays, television is, I would say, the critical medium when trying to engage large number of people, uh, numbers of people with these issues. I'm not just talking about crime, I'm talking about wealth inequality, climate change, gender, gender inequality, the spread of weaponry from small to nuclear, advanced persistent cyber threats, corruption, uh, and of course, organized crime as, as well. Because the fact is, the greater the public awareness about these subjects and how they are woven together, the greater the support and pressure to advance both operational and strategic policies to deal with them successfully. Now, I can assure you that McMafia will be a riveting watch when it comes out, but I hope that viewers will learn a little bit more behind the reality of money laundering, people trafficking, the illegal narcotics industry, and how such issues relate to corruption, banking, politics, the legal profession, and importantly, policy decisions as well. Given recent events in countries as diverse as Brazil, the United States, Turkey, Malaysia, along with many more, I think the series could hardly be more timely. Now, when I was researching the book, I quickly appreciated, this was 10 years ago, that organized crime valued many of the tools used by people working in the licit economy, not to mention the people themselves. The leaders of criminal syndicates have always, where possible, cultivated relationships with politicians, with businessmen, lawyers, journalists, civil servants, and the members of other key professions who, for one reason or another, are open to cooperation, intimidation, or bribery. Paltry salaries for public servants, for example, have often proved an invaluable aid to organized crime. <coughs> Above all, the proceeds of organized crime mingle with respectable businesses and individuals in the deliberately obscure backwaters of money laundering and offshore banking centers where money accrued from corruption, tax evasion, pyramid schemes, and criminal enterprise flow beyond the grasp of revenue services and law enforcement as we have seen with the Paradise Papers, uh, not to mention the Panama Papers. However, while it wasn't hard to identify this murky confluence, I failed to anticipate when I was writing the book just how warmly elites around the globe, including in the most influential capitals like Washington, D.C., would embrace <coughs> the culture, the techniques, and the mor morality of McMafia. Planet McMafia has become so tightly entwined with the world of finance, politics, the law, and its enforcement, that it's often impossible to distinguish between them. I would even argue that the world of organized crime, the rapid deterioration in our economic prospects since 2008, and <coughs> increasing political instability are all closely connected. Money from multiple explicitly criminal sources has been funding illicit enterprises on an ever grander scale. We have observed it in real estate transactions in New York and Miami, to mining ventures in West Africa, across the collapse of Greece, and to the sale on world, world markets of oil extracted in territories under the control of the Islamic State. In all instances, oligarchs, organized crime bosses, and their collaborators in both the private and public sectors have made billions of dollars at the expense of taxpayers and law-abiding citizens. Now, it's hard to imagine that Brexit and Trump would have succeeded without the decision of British and American governments to hand out billions to save banks 
whose criminal recklessness came within a few weeks of bringing down the global financial system. Barely a week goes by that we don't learn of some story or other of egregious corruption, whether in the most advanced democracies, autocracies, or hardened dictatorships. Dictatorships, the Paradise Papers, of course, being the latest outcrop on a Matterhorn of malfeasance. I mention this because these are the institutions which are facilitating organised crime. <coughs> to tackle the latter, we need to reform the former. How, for example, can large parts of the political and economic elite in Brazil even pretend to offer moral and legislative guidance on crime when so much of it is mired in the car wash scandal, the largest corruption case in history involving in the region of $50 billion. And incidentally, the car wash scandal began as an investigation into criminal uh, money laundering before it made its way to the Congress and beyond in Brasilia. Now, I want to talk about uh, three or four areas of what people would see as uh, traditional uh, organized crime to bring it back to the uh, actual activities that uh, people understand uh, by the phrase. And I want to uh, start off, uh, and the reason why I'm looking at these uh, three or four examples um, is because I want to look at how you can, how, how organized crime is changing and how you can deal with various things. So let's take the example at the moment on, in the, of the uh, trade in endangered wildlife species, uh, which has seen a tremendous upsurge, particularly in the past 10 to 15 years with the expansion of the Chinese economy. And in particular, I'm talking about the issue of the trade in uh, ivory and in rhino horns. Um, Fortunately, the rhino pop the I beg your pardon, the elephant population uh, in Africa is now slightly beginning to stabilize, but in the seven years up until 2016, we lost something in the region of a, a third of the population um, of the elephants uh, in Africa. Uh, something in the region of 27,000 elephant elephants were being poached each year and their tusks then sent to uh, Vietnam and China. What was interesting about this is that originally, and the same is true with uh, uh, the rhinoceros, both the black and white rhinoceroses, which are, are both the black rhinoceros in particular, close to extinction as a consequence of this, this trade. Now initially, the trade was merely in China. Uh, China wanted um, a rhino horn for uh, medicinal, sort of traditional Chinese medicinal stroke aphrodisiac purposes, uh, and they wanted ivory for uh, trinkets and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that market was big in China. The Chinese government actually cooperated with CITES and uh, other countries around the world. CITES is the organization which tracks endangered, endangered species, and it has uh, some operational uh, capacity, but basically works on a diplomatic level. And uh, the Chinese actually responded to this, and the Chinese started cracking down on the import and the distribution of uh, goods coming from endangered wildlife species uh, in uh, Africa. Um, all sorts of criminal organizations were involved in this trade. It's a very complex transit to get um, the products from endangered species from Africa to uh, China. And what happened when China started to crack down on this business is the locus of the distribution and sale of these goods shifted to Vietnam. Uh, and Vietnam in the past five to seven years has become the main distributor, selling primarily to Chinese uh, Chinese um, clients, although just as is the case with something like narcotics, if your country becomes a transit and distribution land uh, for a particular commodity, then very quickly that commodity starts taking root uh, in the transit land as, as well. And so Vietnam, Vietnam also became a market. Um, now, this is a trade which can only be prevented by 
concerted, uh, concerted action, uh, policing action at a governmental and a country, at a country level. Um, and I'm glad to say that it looks like progress is being made here. Whether it's going to be made in time to save the black rhinoceros is very much open to question. But there are literally hundreds of species which are endangered, which are being traded around the world at the moment. And uh, it is a good thing, it's a very useful area to get people engaged with um, uh, in terms of communicating and understanding what's going on in organized crime because it has a very, people tend to respond very emotively to the, to the, and understandably to the trade in endangered trade in wildlife species. So there's something which has to work uh, at a, a, a large governmental level, but there is some evidence that it is uh, working at the moment. Um, secondly, I want to go on to the issue of drug law reform and what is happening in narcotics trade ar uh, around the world. Um, <clears throat> this remains uh, an extremely violent trade, particularly if you happen to live in either of the producer countries or the distribution countries, <coughs> producer countries like Colombia, like Afghanistan, distribution countries, the most obvious one is uh, Mexico, as most of the cocaine arriving in the United States uh, comes through Mexico and of course not just in Mexico but in countries like uh, Brazil as well we have homicides with, that are attributed uh, to the narcotics trade and also the policy of the war on drugs um, which far exceed the United Nations designation of uh, uh, the number of deaths um, uh, to uh, call a situation a, a civil war. Um, uh, Mexico which I visited recently is still in a fearful state of corruption and violence because of the trade in cocaine. But one of the things that's been happening is strategies of harm reduction are slowly becoming more popular around the world, starting in a country like Switzerland. And we see rates of criminality go down in Switzerland as uh, harm reduction policies are introduced. And in Central and South America itself, we have seen against the advice and pressure of Washington DC, which is where the uh, drive for the war on drugs still comes from primarily, we have seen uh, the decriminalization or legalization of most drugs in, in a majority of the countries of Central and South America, uh, the most notable exception at the moment being, uh, being Brazil. Um, so uh, that remains a tremendous challenge for the producer and distrib distributor countries. But what we're seeing in the consumer areas, particularly uh, in the United States, is we've seen the move towards the legalization in certain states of marijuana. There are now seven states and the District of Columbia which have legalized marijuana. And uh, I think it's about 21 states which have uh, downgraded it, decriminalized it, or made it into uh, a misdemeanor. Why is that happening? Well, I think there are four reasons why this is happening. First of all, you're getting a generation of baby boomers growing up who are still using or who tolerate the use of marijuana. And so you get a cross-generational uh, public pressure on state authorities to do something about uh, the legalization of recreational uh, marijuana. Then you have uh, the... Uh, um, issue of harm reduction uh, and the, the lowering of criminality which um, they're, they're learning from places like Switzerland and then you see another thing coming in and that is very quickly states that have legalized marijuana are developing their own huge dependency on the tax revenues coming in from that marijuana so if you look at Colorado which had sales uh, of 1.3 billion dollars worth of marijuana in 2016, the tax revenue accruing from that was $200 million, $40 million of which went straight into ed the education system because it's hypothecated. Um, and that has proved very, very valuable. This is now over twice the amount that Colorado earns every year from taxes on either alcohol uh, or tobacco. So it's a very significant shift. But for me, I think there's also another important thing that's been going on, 
and that is that um, you are seeing production and distribution move away from the traditional areas like uh, Central and South America, and it's coming home to roost in the consumer areas. So this has been facilitated in particular by the internet and the internet distribution of narcotics. I myself have just been going around interviewing students at various <coughs> universities in the United Kingdom who are trading in, in narcotics off the, uh, uh, the um, uh, marketplaces on the, uh, on, the dark, on the dark web. And uh, there are some very interesting things about this. The point about if you go over to the dark web to do your drug distribution, you take it off the streets, violence disappears from the drug distribution game, which is very important for some of them. You also have purity levels of about twice what you have um, if you're buying it off the street. So there have <coughs> been tests done on the cocaine bought from uh, various drug markets. It's about 74% purity on average, as opposed to 49% purity <coughs> from the cocaine uh, bought off the streets. So it's changing the nature. And of course, what's interesting is cocaine is not the highest selling narcotics on the web. The highest selling narcotic is MDMA or ecstasy. And that is not produced in South America or Central America. That tends to be produced in Canada, in Serbia, in Bulgaria, in Israel. You're getting much closer to where consumption takes place, Holland as well as a big producer. And what this means is, is that this imposes incredible pressures uh, on law enforcement because they're no longer just dealing with a few kids going around uh, <coughs> deprived areas of Manchester or, or Liverpool and rounding them up, or as is the case is the same with the projects in the United, the United States. You're now dealing with an entire infrastructure and a production industry, that's particularly true with marijuana all over the Western world now, which you have to deal with at a time of austerity when your resources and your budget are being uh, whittled away. And so the pressure for some form of decriminalization and legalization is also a response to um, the ability of police to manage all this. Now, I've run over my time already, but before I go, I'm just going to show you, I, might, I thought I might as well show you if I can get the technology right. Um, the, uh, a, a quick, yeah, here we go. Uh, a quick show of the, the trailer of McMafia so you can see what you've got in store for you. I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Educated at a private school in England. I run my own firm in the city. I'm very happy with my life the way it is. Yeah, you just have a lot of people to come by. On the left is the Hall of Peace. On the right is the Hall of War. Which one would you like to see? January, January the 1st, we think, is the transmission date for the first episode, BBC One, 9 o'clock. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks a lot. I am actually going to follow my colleague, Professor Cox, and issue a can complaint. I think it's very unfair to the rest of the panel that you make us follow James Norton. <laughs> it's just <laughs> not allowed. Thank you very much for a fantastic key keynote. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think it sets the stage very well for a discussion around our book. Um, I wanted to take two minutes, if you don't mind, to explain a little bit, actually, in response to some of the points that Misha raised, why we would look at something so concrete as military assets when the future of organized crime is cyber and illicit flows and elites. 
I think we certainly, I at least was struck in your point at the irony of you know, what is a warship or what is a, what is a military supposed to do when we're talking about money being spirited out of the system, when we're talking about crime behind computers. But actually, when we started, plan or what sort of the genesis of this book, and uh, Sasha Jesperson was also one of the uh, editors, came out at a time when military assets seemed extremely relevant. I mean, we, we around April 2015, were working on various issues of transnational crime. And you know, I remember very, very much a speech by the top EU official on migration at the time, who had just come out of the famous Valletta summit where they were looking for a response to migration. He said, we will act now. Europe has declared a war on people smuggling. And this was followed a couple of days later by a speech uh, by the Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, who said, you know, we had this very effective response to maritime piracy in the coast of Somalia. The EU forces did wonderfully. We will be just as effective in the Mediterranean. Same time, same period, we had, as you raised, this issue of the, you know, the battle for the rhino, where some of the southern African countries were talking about scaling up with drone war warfare. They were arming their rangers to the point of, sort of paramilitary force in order to counter illicit networks poaching their wildlife species. At the same time still, we had an enormous amount of debate leading up to the UN Special Session on Drugs, the UNGAS, which was a year later, where all of the pre-cooking and pre-negotiations about, you know, are we going to finally move away from the war on drugs rhetoric? And there were countless articles around that time saying, the war on drugs has unquestionably and unconclusively failed. No, no, no doubt about it, it's time to move on. And then I remember also a series of articles that were saying, well, you know, very sarcastically, you know, whenever we declare a war on anything, we're guaranteed to fail. So, you know, it really got us thinking, I think, about so what, what is a war on? What does it mean to people? Why, why does it work? Why do we do it if it's guaranteed to fail? I mean, the war on terror rhetoric was going around at the same time. You know, what does it mean for a fight against organized crime to deploy military assets? What does it mean to be militarized? And this was all going on along with another set of debates, which was the precursors to the ratification of the Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda, the follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals, where those of us nerds in the organized crime community were very excited to see uh, Target in Goal 16, the Peace and Justice Goal, actually specifically focused on the fight against organized crime. It was, of course, like many of the SDG targets, completely unrealistic because it claimed that we would end all forms of organized crime by 2030. Of course we will. But not only there, when we began to look more closely at the SDG goals and targets that were being negotiated at the time, you saw them scattered all over. You know, in goals on health, you saw responses to drug trafficking and injecting drug use and the impact on HIV AIDS transmission. In goals on gender, you saw responses to uh, human trafficking. In the goals on children's rights, child trafficking, in wildlife, both and, and environmental protection, biodiversity protection, both on land and sea. There was the need to respond to wildlife trafficking, the need to respond to illicit fishing. So, you know, systematically, we'd counted 23 of the 169 <coughs> targets of the Sustainable <coughs> Development Goals related directly to countering some form of organized crime behavior, which was coming out at nearly 15% of the total. And I think that's quite striking for an issue that only five years previously was considered a hard security issue which development money couldn't be spent and was considered non dackable So, you know, here on the one hand, the war on drugs rhetoric was being spread across multiple forms of crime. On the other hand, the development community was bravely taking up the charge to say that perhaps there was another way. And so I think our inquiry was to try and see, you know, what actually, where do they fit together? What does it mean to deploy military assets? And does it mean the same thing as militarization? Where is an army, a navy, an air force, a drone effective, and where isn't it? And what perhaps, because we found it actually astonishingly understudied, is there any sense of actually what the impact of this military war on rhetoric, this war on approach, could actually be? So we ended up jointly with, Sasha at the time was at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, and the Global Initiative, we hosted four panels, one on each form of crime that we had selected, drug trafficking, wildlife trafficking, arms trafficking, and 
human smuggling, which was already an odd one, and then on piracy. And we brought together a series of practitioners, so representatives of the armed forces, academics, policy makers, analysts, look, representing different parts of the world, looking at country case studies, and we had a series of debates, open public debates, I mean, very well attended, sort of 50, 60 people, also often heralding with a great deal of investment in the issue. We discussed it, and then we wrote it up. So we wrote it up in this hideously expensive book, <laughs> as you rightly point out. But in our defense, I will say that the online version is only 30 euros. We have a 20% discount voucher on the back of these things, so feel free to take advantage of it. And you can always encourage your libraries to buy it. We also summarized it all into a policy brief, which is free. So no excuses, please. Thank you very much. Um, and we will get a better published next time, I promise. Um, so what we're hoping to do, I think, in a little bit of this debate, since we, of course, only have four of our contributors instead of the full 14, to give a little bit of a flavor of some of the issues that were discussed, to have an interesting conversation, to pick up some contemporary themes on organized crime and hopefully send you all home passionately interested and engaged to find what is the right way to begin to talk about this effectively <laughs> increasingly global scourge, which is having such an enormous impact on our electoral politics and stability for many people. So on that note, I will briefly introduce our panel, if that's okay, or shall I invite you to introduce yourself? Misha's going to get lumped into the panel with us. Um, we will do a couple of questions just to kick off the conversation. We'll open it up at least once or twice to the floor to also stimulate debate. So we really encourage your, your questions. We have a fantastic bunch of speakers who are here to roughly represent their chapters and their sectors, but I know are very versatile and experienced and will take on anything we can throw at them. At least we, we think they can. <laughs> So I'm pleased very much to introduce my co-editor, -ed Sasha Jesperson, who is the director of the Center on Modern Slavery, Slavery at St. Mary's University and was formerly a senior research analyst at RUSI, as I said. She has a, a very impressive and diverse portfolio, ranging from the international drugs trade through to truly balancing the security development divide as it responds to organized crime. Can I pitch to you the first question? So, ma'am. What we found when we were reading is that a lot of the justification for the deployment of military assets is, was, was that the organized criminals themselves were militarized. The drug traffickers were coming with the full scope of AK-47s and military assets, that poachers were working in the national parks similarly armed, so that the only way to respond was through a militarized response from a government. To what extent do you think that that was true, and is that what you saw in your own research? I think it's true in terms of legitimizing the response. And Professor Cox summed this up quite well in his introductory remarks in that it, a military response to organized crime sends a powerful message in, in terms of what we're going to do. It achieves quick wins, it um, provides direct pursuit of criminals, which makes good news, and, and a show of force. And so this is why it becomes the fallback response in many cases. So Tuesday mentioned in 2015 when the EU decided to um, use naval forces to respond to migration through the Mediterranean. And, and it doesn't always fail in that regard. I think the response to piracy in Somalia um, is probably a different case in that there wasn't a strong state, but in most cases where military responses have actually been the most effective is where there is already a strong state in existence. And so two of the examples that came up in the discussions that we had uh, that became part of this book, one was in East Africa, where the Royal Lancers were doing training of anti-poaching units to um, track animal herds in order to intercept the poachers and, and in West Africa the response to pi piracy there where it was very much driven by um, states in the region rather than international military forces um, and so in those cases it wasn't necessarily that the criminal groups outpowered or um, had resources that the state didn't have because the state was well equipped to respond so in those instances there was scope to do more than just military activities and actually there was much more going on than just the military response but because the military response makes and better news, that's what we hear about the most. And so it is often part of a larger strategy. But also, we like to talk about this military strategy because it, it gives a sense of action. Uh, but what is actually done on the ground is necessarily um, smaller than what is being talked about because it just is very expensive to do military engagement. And I think this says something to the motivations of why we're responding <coughs> to certain types of organized crime and why we're willing to use military assets to do it. Um, because in many of the cases where military strategies have been used, 
it's more about containing organized crime rather than about addressing some of the structures that make it happen. Thanks, Sasha. So John, if I could ask you, John Collins um, of LSE and LSE, uh, the US Center now. So our co-host here. <coughs> so, I mean, you have a very different take, I think. Why do societies actually tend to call a war on drugs specifically? Yeah, well, I think in this context, the war on drugs is the penultimate example of a militarized response to crime, right? This has been going for four decades. Um, quick show of hands, who thinks the war on drugs has worked? <coughs> right, who thinks it hasn't worked? Who's not sure? Right, so that's, that's pretty reflective of, of what I would see when I ask that question in forums. Like, nobody seems to think that this approach to policy has worked over the last four, four decades. And I don't think anyone has any sense that over the coming decades that it will work. So there's, there is, as Misha highlighted, I think, extremely well, there is a drive towards finding alternative policies to this. Um, I think as we do that, the question we have to ask is, why do societies pursue a kind of war on drugs? And I have to say, my view on the answer to that is, it is often very little to do with the drugs themselves. It's to do with the social issues that underpin uh, a lot of the things that determine drug use and how drugs interact with society. So even if we were to take, for example, the opiate crisis in the US, I was at a seminar in Yale last week uh, discussing this issue. And the fundamental point is, when we talk about something like, you know, we want the easy answer. Oh, well, it's over-prescribing of opiates by physicians, then people get pushed off them, then they go up to, to heroin, and that's when we see the heroin trade regrowing in, in Mexico, right? And it's that this is a fundamentally much more complex discussion. Um, one of the things that came up, which I hadn't, why I hadn't actually considered, was that one of the reasons that uh, people prescribe opiates for chronic pain in the US, and, and by the way, opiates are not, very are not a very effective medicine for chronic pain, is because people don't have sufficient healthcare coverage, don't get sufficient time off work when they're suffering from chronic pain to recover as, as per would be the normal, the normal uh, treatment in, in somewhere like Europe. So people get given opiates as a stopgap measure to, to enable them to go back to work. And unless you address those kind of fundamental things in society, um, you're, you're, you're going to have the kind of spillover effects that, that we know as the war on drugs, or these approaches, these simplistic quick fix approaches, which is more police, more military, more tough responses. Thanks, John. Misha, you look like you're nodding a lot in agreement there. Well, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, the thing is, I, my experience of, the, of uh, military deployment is in the favelas of Rio. Um, we recently, actually today, there was deployment of the military in one of the favelas uh, near Rio. And uh, the favela that I worked in and I lived in, Hosinia, recently had an, uh, a flare-up of, um, uh, of uh, fighting. It was actually uh, a split within the faction that controlled this particular favela. And the response of the government was to deploy the military. Um, over 1,000 um, soldiers were put into Rosinia uh, for about three or four days, cost an absolute fortune. Um, and it did absolutely nothing because <coughs> the military is an entirely inappropriate instrument to deal with uh, th just physically somewhere like the, so somewhere like a, a favela. Uh, but also, I mean, I was interested about your refer reference to the strong, <coughs> strong state. What the state of Brazil has done over the past 50 years is to ignore these spaces, ignore the favelas. And uh, they're effectively outside of state control, which is why that vacuum has been filled by uh, cartels who make a lot of money out of the cocaine trade and can afford this extraordinary weaponry. Although, in Hosinia, which is the largest uh, favela in Rio, where you have about 100,000 people, the maximum they've ever had under arms there is about 120 people. And those 120 people police that entire 100,000 who are there. Uh, and when the military comes in, it can suppress them for the period that it's there, but you can't afford to keep the military there, so after four days, out they come, and uh, the problem remains. And the underlying issues that you pointed out, John, which in uh, Rio's case is uh, wealth, in, wealth inequality, extreme poverty, lack of access to all sorts of services, and so on, uh, those simply don't get, uh, don't get addressed. So in the world of shocking parallels, Anya, <laughs> Dr. Anya Shortland, a reader and professor for one of you at King's College, um, you've done a lot of work on the economics of piracy 
If I could ask you to perhaps take some of the analysis of our colleagues and apply it <coughs> to the piracy in the Gulf of Aden, which, as I said, we and we quoted our Italian Prime Minister, is considered the success story of naval assets. I mean, would you see that as <coughs> success? Um, not an unqualified success, but, but definitely a success. Um, very much the question of a fallback option. This is, this is what we always do. The navies were very keen on getting involved. They said, we know how to do this. We do convoys. We do area protection. This is the kind of thing that, that, that we can do. And yes, the naval intervention was a complete success. Um, maybe not entirely as a counter-piracy operation, but it was a complete PR success for the navies. Um, they were on the back foot after Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the politicians had become sea blind. Um, suddenly there was something for navies to do, so they were really pleased with that. Um, it was a huge diplomatic success in putting an international naval force together, the first ever European intervention, military intervention, naval intervention all of them together, and they also got Russia and China involved, so they were developing all sorts of platforms for how to deal with non-allied countries. It was a fantastic success. Was it a counter-piracy success? Well, maybe that's a little bit more qualified. It, it took a long time to become successful. There were, there were successful uh, occasionally stopping pirates, but they didn't have a follow through. So it was a catch and release operation, which didn't really put the Somali pirates off very much. You needed the legal follow through, lots of institution building. You needed the ship owners to get on board as well. And it was only really with private security that the military intervention was completely successful. So a, a private public partnership. So yes, it was a success story, um, eventually. I think the main quibble that I have with it, and that picks up some of the points that the uh, other panelists have made, is that, is it, a, is it value for money? So there are various estimates of what it costs to, to put that amount of naval equipment into the Indian Ocean on the Gulf of Aden, 1.2 billion doesn't seem that far off the mark. To solve the problem that transferred $50 million a year from ship owners to Somali pirates. So it doesn't seem like a particularly sensitive, <coughs> fine enough tool to deal with this much of a problem with this huge hammer. So. Yes, it was successful, but was it was it bang for buck? Um, I'm not convinced. Can I choose that? Yeah, please. I was just at a seminar, and there was a great quote. Um, when it, it, I think it applies to this idea of militarization. When you have a when you have a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail, mm -hmm. so it becomes a lot easier <laughs> to use it, right? Yeah. But I think I mean Anya, you say that the response to Somali piracy was slow, but they had the problem looked in two years. If you take the uh, trans-Mediterranean smuggling issue, I think our politicians would have killed to have an answer in two years. In fact, they pretty much are. So, I mean, here we are nearly six years into the migrant crisis, if you count from when we would consider counting, which is when people started dying in large numbers in the Mediterranean. And yet, the similar deployment, EU NAV4 to EU NAV4 MED, hasn't worked. Sasha, you want to tell me why? <laughs> I knew you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think in part that's because they're completely different problems um, and there's a real issue with dealing with people as the commodity that you're talking about something where it's very dangerous when you're using military tools to respond because you are potentially putting people at risk so there's a tension there um, but also the, the whole strategy has not necessarily been thought through and you can see that now um, the EU is starting to think about moving further upstream so there was an article last week about putting boots on the ground in Libya. So again, using military strategies, but trying to contain or stop people from making that journey. So it's not working stopping people in the Mediterranean, so let's try and stop them from getting to the Mediterranean. And it's interesting just how far that strategy has gone. So recently, 
I've been doing some research in Sudan where, um, as part of the Khartoum process, the Sudanese government has supported the rapid, rapid support force um, to patrol the region towards the Libyan border in Sudan. Um, and this force comes out of what was the Janjaweed um, in the Darfur conflict. So it's really just about trying to push further and further um, upstream to stop the problem from coming to Europe without engaging with the factors that are actually causing people to move. Um, and I think there's a similar statement that could be said about Somalia, that you're dealing with the consequences of the problem, you're not dealing with um, what's causing it. Fair enough, I'll take that one. Thank you. And just before we take a round of questions to the floor, I wanted to pick up, and maybe to the panel in general, um, but I'll stick it on Misha if nobody else answers. I mean, that we've just put, picked up on this question of boots on the ground. In our Central America chapter, which looked at the war and drugs evolution in Colombia and Mexico, it was very much noted that initially the military was the instrument of choice because they had public confidence, whereas the policing institutions or the civilian ins security institutions didn't. They were seen as weak and corrupt. So the military actually went with the people's blessings initially, but that has ended up two, three decades later as very much changing people's perceptions of that strong arm of the state. I was wondering, you know, for anyone who wants to comment really, in an era of corruption, where obviously anything that sticks out as in the fight against organized crime is a target for corruption, what is the risk to, um, to the military? What is the risk to the state that chooses to use it? Well, in the, in the case of Mexico, it's a very good case. Uh, after President Calderon began the full tilt war on drugs by uh, deploying all manner of federal forces, including the military, very quickly, the military <coughs> elements in the military were corrupted. And uh, you found some of them cooperating with uh, various cartels against uh, other cartels. You found them involved in extrajudicial killings. And that confidence that there was in the military that you mentioned to start with um, eroded extremely quickly and we saw the rates of homicide in, in Mexico uh, from 2005 onwards um, uh, go through the roof. One of the strategies that the army was, as well as the, the federal, federal police was responsible for, was decapitating the cartels. And what this did was to lead to instability in an area controlled by a, st a, a cartel so that you would have a struggle for power amongst the remaining members, but also, for example, uh, in Yucatan, uh, which, which uh, was controlled by the Gulf Cartel uh, until the assassination of its leader in 2000 and early 2007, late 2006, early 2007. The Sinaloa Cartel, which was led by the, uh, the famous uh, El Chapo Guzman, <coughs> Um, saw this as an opportunity to move into Yucatan, and you soon had an unholy three-way war in Yucatan between Sinaloa, uh, the Gulf Cartel, and the military. Uh, and it was very, very difficult for, for people to identify uh, who was the sort of morally preferable, uh, uh, preferable um, uh, force in there. <coughs> Yeah, so if, and, and I, I completely agree with the narrative Misha has given on Mexico, and if, if I was to apply something similar to Colombia, the fundam again, to get back to the fundamental issues faced versus this perception of, well, it's all about drugs and it's, all the, you know, it's about this commodity that's the problem. When you look at something like Colombia, it's about the state trying to expand its control into areas where it has had none. And so the only way it can do that when there's resistance from some of these groups is to use the military. That is its boots in the ground, right? The problem with that is it has these unintended effects, which is instead of actually suppressing coca cultivation, it disperses it. And these people move further away from you know, uh, semi-urban centers in rural areas to just further and further into the rainforest beyond the reach of the state. And so there's this cat and mouse game between the coca farmers and the state between, uh, uh, around actually trying to eradicate the, the production of coca. And what that does from the state's perspective is, or the problem with that from the state's perspective is, they're relying on the band-aid of the military, which is never going to solve the problem. It's just going to keep displacing it. So they can sp they've stopped spraying for the interim, but they're probably going to go back to aerial spraying, or they may go back to aerial spraying at some point. 
is that you're relying, you consistently rely on this, this, this apparent solution, right? Oh, well, we have, we've sprayed 10,000, 100,000 hectares of coca. We're doing something, we're having some effect. Well, not if farmers are pl planting twice as much in order to mitigate against the fact that some of their crops will get, will get sprayed. Or not if you're actually creating instability and conflict in these areas when actually you're trying to integrate them politically with the, with the, with the mainstream of Colombian society. So uh, Colombia is somewhere I spend quite a bit of time. And the problem we see now is you've had this peace process and it's built around these ideals of integration and uh, bringing these communities back in or at least building state presence in these communities in certain ways. And what it appears is there's this knee-jerk tendency to just want to go back to their comfort zone, it's certainly on the right of the political spectrum in Colombia, which is, let's just go back to the military. Let's just go back to aerial spraying. We don't actually need to integrate these communities. We just need them to get them to stop growing coca. And I think that's the danger, is that once you start going down that militarized route, it's hard to go back again. If I could ask you particularly, Anna, because you said that there was an enthusiasm on the part of the Navy to assume this responsibility. I mean, I, for those of you, and maybe also to the audience, if, why would you, why given all the potential pitfalls and the lessons learned and the p negative experiences, which are pretty globally dispersed at this point, do we continue to see the, ne the military forces be prepared to take on this role? I mean, why even enthusiastically volunteering, which I have to say is often the perception that I see when I go to meetings, that they see a role and they want to be there and they want to go in and they want to stay in and they want to go back. I, I just say in Brazil, the military do not want to be deployed in favelas, and they make that fairly plain to uh, federal and the state authorities uh, in Rio. But it goes back to, to what you were th what you were talking about, Anya, about this being a PR thing. It's about showing that the government is doing something, regardless of what the actual uh, impact is, uh, and the military behind the scenes makes its feelings. Uh, 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 known that this is not something it's prepared to do in the long term. I think it's worth adding that if you look over the next 15 to 20 years, what you're looking at is, is this is going to become a more intense de debate in the global <coughs> south in particular, as urban areas expand. And uh, at the moment, it doesn't look as though we're coming up with terribly creative solutions to deal with overcrowding increasing wealth inequality and, and poverty, which for me are often the, uh, the root causes of how organized crime becomes sufficiently powerful to challenge the state itself, because that's really what we're talking about in the global <coughs> south, rather different, I would say, in the global north. Just very quickly, I think it's, um, Professor Cox and myself were in Colombia January 2016, and this was around the height of the peace process negotiations. And we had an event with President Santos and much of his cabinet. And you could see the divide on stage, right? Mm -hmm. It's the military versus those who are interested in pursuing development approaches. Mm -hmm. And there is a pretty clear explanation for what drives a lot of that. There is a, there is a political economy of the, around this, around funding. Some agency, some part of government is going to lose out relative to the other. If the government decides to invest increasing resources in development-oriented drug policy, well then the military may find it has less of a role and less of a call for resources. And I think that, that basic fact just needs to be acknowledged a bit. Can I ask you, so just on wildlife crime, and because I realize none of the panelists from that section were there, and, but one of the things that came up in terms of the, a lot of the organizations that are engaging in the response to wildlife crime in East Africa tend to be staffed by um, army veterans. So they're looking for another role now that they've retired from their official army um, post. And so one organization that was discussed, Vetpor, is probably more notorious in that they see East Africa as an ungoverned space and that there's a role for them to go in and effectively shoot poachers. And so it's more um, fi finding a role for themselves still and using their skills. Fantastic. I'm going to yeah, open you up. Uh, that, that, that was also a sort of two-pronged approach in, in, in Somalia, that the Navy was very much interested in putting themselves back into the public picture as a relevant service and after two landlocked, uh, effectively, conflicts. Um, but yeah, the private security business, uh, it was also a time when, when, when there was a lot of redundancy in, in, in the army and, and this was, yeah, again, an opportunity uh, for people specialized in, in the production of, 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 of violence or protection or security or generally it, um, to be deployed and, and, and profitably employed. 
Fantastic. I'd like to open to a round of questions from the floor, and then I'll come back to our panel, perhaps, to a little bit to talk to you what some of the alternatives are. Oh, good. That's more nice. Um, I have three gentlemen over here. One, two, three. Can we go one or two louder? We'll take, if you don't mind, take a couple of questions and then answer them in a group. Uh, uh, really, one question. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, you do appear to have taken what I would call a deep dive, but can I just go back uh, and take a more global view? Are we not entering an era where the state, in actual fact, has withered and the non-state part of the world is gaining more power? But my question really is, what will happen when the Chinese are the superpower? Okay, I'm sorry, we um, I, I can assure you we have not colluded in the questions. Um, my question follows on. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm the former Customs and Excise Intelligence Analyst for Transnational Crime and the ex-Soviet Union. And after I left, most of my work was in uh, Ukraine and Central Asia. One consequence of that is I am a firm believer in the value of Mr. Glennie's book and that the TV series should be compulsory viewing for an awful lot of people. And I would also add that applies to dark matter because I've seen the militarized deep state of Russia, of Russia, at Odessa. My question follows on from David's point about China is who is, do you believe Western law enforcement and Western government in cooperation with law enforcement fully realizes what they are up against with China and Russia as deep states which use certain aspects of organized crime, quite a lot actually, and particularly the financial flows from it as geopolitical tools. I firmly believe a military response is necessary in certain fields, and, but I would argue that that is a military style command and control and intelligence, not necessarily physical force assets. So I'm not taking an either or an absolutist position. But how's Western law enforcement responding? Good evening, my name is Jonathan Mueller. I'm from 1988 to 1990, I was the program officer for Columbia in the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics. Products affairs. So I was one. Of, I was a participant in, and even a driver of the militarization of the war on drugs. I want to come back to the question of why do we have a war on drugs or a war on terror or any of these other wars? Because I'm not sure that the panel really got to the heart of the matter. Doesn't the term war on drugs go back to the Nixon administration, mm -hmm. at a time when in the United States we already had a war on poverty? and probably various other wars that I can't remember because I was even e younger than an LSE undergraduate at the time. Uh, and it far predates the militarization of America's war on drugs, which I would date to my own days, to the, to the um, Bush the Elder administration. So isn't the, isn't the reason we have all these wars really a question of American political rhetoric and divorced from any real reality of what's actually happening? Hi, um, I'm Chloe Zoller. I'm a master's student in IR here at LSE. And my question is kind of attached to the previous one. I was in Columbia last year on a Fulbright grant, and so I was like kind of looking at Plan Columbia and its impact. So I kind of want to know how much or what role does Plan Columbia or like the US still play in the um, misuse or misunderstanding of the role of the military in these counter narcotics efforts? Well, Jonathan, I, I, I know, I, we know each other, we've discussed this topic before. Um, I agree 
Uh, the war on drugs, I'm a historian of this topic. You can find r the term war on addiction as early as the 1950s, 1960s, and probably earlier. So I think the, the, uh, I always quote unquote the war on drugs because it's, it basically is such a subjective term and is so relative to who's using it. Um, Nixon is such an easy one, for, especially for people who dislike the idea of a war on drugs. It's just very easy to equate it with Richard Nixon, right? He's not a particularly lovable politician. So if you want to discredit the idea associated with Richard Nixon, I, I think the Nixonian idea of a war on drugs was, uh, as has been well documented, probably majority focused on treatment funding and uh, demand reduction sides. Um, I think ultimately you're right, it was the Reagan era that really saw what we would consider the modern militarized era of the war on drugs. I think Clinton continued that. Uh, I think we were really more, what, there were some, there were, I mean, there, was, there, were, there, was, there was intermittent use of the military in the Reagan administration, things like the Operation Blast Run, but the involvement of the military, and also CIA, really, there's, there's like a door opening when, when Bush, when Bush was president. Sure. And I think you're probably right because Reagan saw it more as a, counter a, a, a means towards counter-communism, whereas Bush probably saw it more about countering illicit flows in itself. You're, you're right in that regard. And it also, it depends on whether you're talking domestically or internationally. Reagan was more interested in using it as dog whistle politics at home about certain inner city communities that you couldn't quite talk about going after certain inner city communities, but you could talk about things that were associated with them. Um, to the point about Plan Colombia, I think my view on Plan Colombia is very successful as a state building effort, sort of, in, in, in many ways. You know, it brought Colombia back from the brink and the, the, the major disorder it faced. In terms of counter narcotics, it's not a counter, there was no counter narcotics really about Plan Colombia. It was a mechanism or it was a, a way to get it through the US Congress to get funding for state building initiatives within Colombia. So, has it had an effect? Well, Colombia is again at record coca cultivation levels. Um, so I, I think it's just a case of what you attribute its actual aims for versus what it was sold as. I, I can talk a bit to Ewan's point about, uh, about China. I mean, what the situation will be when China is the most powerful economy in the world, I, I, I simply don't know because there are so many, um, there are so many unknowns uh, uh, about that. But uh, I would differentiate slightly between Russian strategy and Chinese strategy when it comes to uh, cyber <coughs> in particular. Um, I, I would say that the, the Russians keep a, um, have a closer relationship between the FSB and uh, uh, criminal uh, hackers uh, <coughs> within the Russian Federation than the Chinese do. The Chinese have their cyber operations tend to be quite centralized and tend to be under the control of the PLA, the People's Liberation, the Li People's Liberation Army. And two years ago, the Americans uh, under Obama came up with a deal with the Chinese who were um, uh, you know, e excessive in their, in their sort of everyday espionage of uh, sending infected PDFs around the UN and around the <laughs> US government and so on, and uh, then exfiltrating data from it. And uh, Obama called uh, Xi on this, actually, um, and uh, they came up with what was effectively a non-aggression pact on, <laughs> on commercial espionage between the two countries. And since then, the okay. number of in PDFs infected by the Chinese circulated in the United States has dropped by 90%. Chinese took this agreement seriously, and in terms of the long term on, on cyber, there is going to have to be some form of accord between the major <coughs> cyber powers in the world uh, about um, if effectively non-aggression. But in terms of crime, I was absolutely fascinated. I was invited to uh, chair a conference at Interpol about three months ago. Uh, which was called by the new Chinese president of Interpol, and it was to discuss the issue of cybercrime. And there were a huge number of people from law enforcement, from banks, from Tencent, from Baidu, all the big, uh, from Alibaba, all the big Chinese companies. And they came and they gave astonishing accounts of how, uh, how much they are under attack from domestic cyber criminals inside China 
And th the reason why they were holding this conference, there were a lot of Europeans there, few Americans, one or two uh, Russians, but mainly Europeans, was they wanted cooperation on this. That, that could actually they have a, a real problem with cyber criminality inside China. And I think the Chinese have understood, or at least are open to discussions with the Americans, the Europeans, and whoever else may be involved, to try and develop some sort of uh, a con consensus on how to deal with this. Russia, may, Russia remains a very uncertain factor in all of this, and of course, it's enjoyed hugely with very little resources um, fulfilling in 2013 the the head of the armed forces in Russia, Valery Gerasimov, um, laid out in a newspaper article something that's called the Gerasimov Doctrine, which um, uh, stated baldly how weak Russia was economically. It's only a tenth of, a tenth of the size of the American economy. It's only half the size of the draggled post-Brexit Britain's economy. And uh, yet it seems to be running most policy in the Middle East and... Uh, has huge influence in Ukraine and so on. And one of the reasons is Gerasimov says we have to use the weaknesses of our opponents, and that is the basically the fragility of our political systems and constitutions in the age of social media and the age of cyber. And they've done that very successfully, very cheaply. They, I, I think they've probably done less in terms of corrupting, uh, corrupting the American political system than some people think, because you just, you know, throw in a few things to the Americans, a few, uh, a few Facebook or, 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 or Twitter bots, and, uh, you know, you've got meltdown and Trump. <laughs> Quickly, somebody asked something about somebody. Yeah, please. Um, anybody else? Uh, my name is um, Anas Salami, I'm from Morocco. Um, uh, we sp when we speak about um, the war on drugs, for instance, um, well, I've raised the campaigns um, on Morocco to legalize cannabis, and, um, and I've done lots of projects over there, but when uh, members of the governments or politicians come to me, they said, okay, go and deal with, with the legislation and the policies that the UN have made previously, and then come back to us, because as soon as we try to open this subject to them, they they freak out and um, and they don't want to allow us basically to um, to work um, because within my country uh, cannabis is not matter of morality. I, it's not you know it's something considered okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Another question or two. Yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Julian Mulich. I'm a postdoc at NSC Ideas. Uh, my question is about the term militarization. I was wondering when you chose that word, are you implying that this is about state-led, um, basically the state imposing this kind of military action? And, or maybe, I mean, it's a good word, so maybe, you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily a conceptual um, issue. But my question was if you think that some of these issues, such as migration and drug use, for example, is there maybe a wider securitization going on in our societies <coughs> that are not necessarily just decided by our governments or certain uh, military actors? Um, I totally take the point that the Navy was very excited to be involved in Somalia, for example, but I realize that when it comes to the military um, action in the Mediterranean, often military actors are wondering what they're actually doing there, and especially because the mandates don't really fit what they're trying to do. So. Is this just the, is this, yeah, the elites deciding that we should use the military more? Is this a society asking for more security on specific issues? Um, where do you see the drivers there? Thank you, and then there's um, that fuller side. My name is Tyler. I uh, did a program here once, but no fancy titles. Um, <laughs> uh, I notice a trend in the United States, as many people have, of uh, other agencies um, using uh, more and more military um, strategies in uh, dealing with um, uh, their posts. 
what would you say, if any, was the effect of using the military on um, uh, more local agencies or um, like even, so I'm thinking ICE, the DEA, or even local police departments um, uh, who actually are receiving a lot of the surplus equipment um, from the military. Uh, what has been the effect of um, international militarization against uh, organized crime and uh, more local crime fighting? Hello. Um, I would like to know if there are any successful um, in interventions by the military trained in humanitarian um, operations uh, regarding crime. Um, at least um, in my country, I come from Chile, um, the, the, arm, the, the military are very proud of having intervened in the Haiti cr crisis. Uh, and having lots of experience in dealing with conflicts in more humanitarian ways. And I don't know if there are experiences applying that to um, crime prevention and fighting. Thank you. Um, maybe I come back to the panel. Sasha, I think there's an issue in there for you. Yeah. Okay. And so I thought I'd pick up on the question about the use of the term militarization. Um, because so at the time when we came up with the idea for what became the book, it was in response to a lot of usage by governments or international <coughs> um, intergovernmental organizations that were relying on military responses. So in part, it was that aspect of it. Um, but the more we delved into it, there was also private military actors that were involved in this as well. So it wasn't just coming from a statement perspective. Uh, but for me, I see responses to organized crime existing on a bit of a spectrum with hard military responses on one end and then uh, more people-centered development on the other. Um, and it's not necessarily a nice, neat spectrum uh, that responses would fit easily on it. Um, but I think that's something that started to come out through the discussions that we had as part of this process. Um, and I think you're right to an extent about responses being very securitized. And this isn't just about military strategies. You could also say the same for law enforcement that is very much about working with security actors, um, but perhaps in a different way uh, that is more about partnerships and capacity building rather than just direct action to pursue criminals. Um, but there has been a lot of discussion about the involvement of development actors and what development agencies can bring to this. And Tuesday mentioned the discussions around the, um, the SDGs and that this is now formally on the agenda. But I think that part of the reason for the securitization of a lot of responses to organized crime has actually been a reluctance on the part of development actors, because this is not an area that they're comfortable dealing with. Uh, there's a lot of issues surrounding organized crime that uh, falls into their mandate that they've been working on for decades, but it's not necessarily badged as organized crime programming, but things around governance, around corruption in particular, and um, even livelihoods programming, a lot of development agencies work with law enforcement, but in a very different way than police or militaries do. Uh, so that reluctance to engage has meant that it has fallen to law enforcement or military to do this work, and they have been perhaps better equipped to deal with it, particularly when you are talking about armed criminal groups. Uh, but I think there is a shift, particularly with uh, the focus on organized crime in the SDGs. Thank you, Sasha. Anna? Yeah, so a lot of my work is on, on protection theory, and the reason we see mafias is often because there is a need for governance, a demand for governance, and no state to provide it. Mm -hmm. A need for personal security, a need for <coughs> property rights enforcement, a need for dispute settlement, a need for contract enforcement. We talked earlier on about an era where the state has withered, maybe the state was never there. But often, mafias provide this kind of governance that the state does not, whether it's in Sicily or whether it's a clan in Somalia that, that, that provides people's deep-seated need to just to know where they are, however unpleasant that governments might be, at least at least it's order of, 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 of some kind of predictability, etc. And sometimes because the state just isn't there, doesn't have the power, and in some cases because the state chooses not to engage by saying this is illegal and therefore you can't run 
the cannabis trade, the marijuana trade from 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 a state um, uh, through the state. So so you, you push it down. And it will have to be governed by mafias because if it's not governed by mafias, it is just tragic disaster. And that's what we see with militarization. The, it disrupts the local response to need for governance by taking away the key figures who provide that governance. And then you get a power vacuum and that's when people start really, really arguing. So. In a way, the idea is possibly well meant that there is there is an absence of state, and you bring that state in. But unfortunately, the military can't actually provide governance. Certainly not over four days. Um, or four decades. Or four, four, four decades. They're just yeah, it's, it's it's just the wrong instrument. Yet you do want more state. But yeah, you want dispute settlement. You want law enforcement. You want you want, you want a proper sewage system in the areas that I've worked yes. in, which you don't have. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and uh, all, all manner of things like that, absolutely. It is the absence of state, which is at uh, the heart of a lot of this, as John said, in, in Colombia as well. Um, can I just address the gentleman from Morocco's point about yes. what... Um, uh, unfortunately, of course, Morocco is also on a transit route um, of cocaine coming from West Africa into Europe, and it's also a producer of marijuana that's uh, occasionally sold in, in Europe. You have a, uh, 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 when it comes to marijuana, I, I'm afraid from a practical point of view, the reform has to come from those countries which are most fervently um, supporting and uh, driving um, the war on drugs, for a want of a better phrase, uh, at the moment. Um, now, uh, and above all, that's the United States. Now, what's happening on marijuana, which is very interesting, if you look at Switzerland and you look at the United States and then you look at Britain, why do we not have any marijuana legalization or much even of a debate here in the United Kingdom? Why do you in Switzerland and why do you in the United States? I would argue it's because of decentralized government that here in the UK, marijuana legalization is uh, something that can only be debated on the national scale, and it occasionally comes up in advance of elections. And this is a very easy thing. You have a, because of our first past the post system, you have a tiny little group of people in the middle of the political spectrum who will determine which way an election goes. And they're unlikely to be in favor of legalizing marijuana, particularly when the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and virtually everyone else is telling them that that's a bad thing. So centralized countries have real difficulty in doing things. However, that's about to change with Canada likely to legalize across the, the provinces, through the federal government, likely to legalize marijuana. And I don't think that Trump and Jeff Sessions are going to be able to stop the process of marijuana legalization state by state in the United States. So when you get that critical mass in, in the US, um, and the reason why I mentioned Switzerland as well is because Switzerland has a very decentralized form of government, and that's why when it came to heroin reform, they were able to do it not just canton by canton, but community by community because of their raging HIV rates at the, at the time. So. Uh, unfortunately, Morocco is primarily under the influence of France. I mean, it's a, France's political issue in that I influence in that part of the world is considerable. That is a very centralized state and less inclined to uh, legislation on uh, legalization of recreational marijuana. Um, so I think you will see that when the United States has finally gone through that process together with Canada, then things will start to buckle in Europe, and once it starts to buckle in Europe, then it will buckle in countries like uh, Morocco as well. But at the moment, things like, uh, one of the things when I was researching the mafia, which really struck me, was talking to people in the UN about uh, US policy and how it's communicated through the UN. It's through the UNODC, 
And I learned from people inside the UNODC that the UNODC is the one agency of the United Nations where the Americans pay up everything that they owe on the dot on the day that that bill falls due. And of course, they were decisive in influencing who would be appointed the head of the UNODC. And uh, they're perfectly happy to see a, a, a Russian there, which is uh, what happened after Antonio Costa went to his Italian, because of the fact that Putin is taking up the mantle as being the foremost warrior when it comes to the issue of drugs. But I think, uh, I, I think when you see the shift, and it will become an avalanche in the US, I think, then the prospect of somewhere like Morocco being able to just use marijuana as normal because that's what the culture dictates anyhow, uh, will become close fairly quickly. Thank you. I just want to pick up and not ask anybody to comment back, but certainly a theme that we've heard from our opening through till now. Repeated, I mean, you, you Misha, made the point that people watch TV. We've heard, I think, from at least three of our speakers this point of dog whistle politics. We've talked about the impact of social media. We've talked about the Daily Express, the Daily Mail. We've talked about, you know, how, and certainly what I, I saw in the analysis that I did on the smuggling, how much this public pressure of the sort of one-way, two-way communication and the way that the media uses outrage often is the trigger to militarized responses. And it satisfies that public itch for something to happen. You know, we saw... Aylan Kurdi, Alan in actual fact his family pronounces it, die on a Turkish beach. Two days later, David Cameron stands up and says, we're sending another warship to the Mediterranean. I mean, that is the response to the boy who died in Turkey. So, you know, it clearly somewhere I think around here, the means by which we communicate, those who communicate our sentiments, who broadcast them, have an enormous responsibility that I'm not sure they're always fulfilling and no accusations to you personally, of course. Um, we're kind of coming close to time, and I wanted to use my panel just one last time. Since we've talked a lot, I think, about the role of the military, and perhaps not come to any clear conclusions, but each of you, in a way, has a community that you represent in terms of the other facets of the response to organized crime. So I think picking, if I could ask you each in a sound bite, John, and also maybe responding to the diplomatic community and picking up from where the UNODC comment left off. I mean, you've worked very much on the diplomatic solutions which might generate a change in organized crime policy. Anya, you in turn have worked a lot on some of the economic underpinnings. I mean, what would an economist bring to this problem which would make it look different? Sasha, you sit there on behalf of the development community. Um, looking at some of the, what, are, what actually are the things that the development community would bring together if we said we wanted to respond to organized crime in a more integrated way. And Misha, having just finished your last book, which was entitled The Battle for Rio, you sat down with a drug kingpin, and he spoke to you about some of his strategies for reducing violence in the favelas and responding to some of the social problems. So I was wondering if we could put his words in your mouth to close off on actually what's the perspectives of the criminals would be in terms of sustainable solutions. So, one after the other, if you don't mind. Sure, um, and I think this directly relates to Morocco. As, as Tuesday said, I've worked on this a lot for the last few years. Um, UN and UNODC has pretty radically had to shift how it addresses this issue because you've seen what has effectively been the breakdown in the global consensus. And part of that has been the US, especially under Obama, stepping out of this role of the global enforcer of the war on drugs. It hasn't completely stopped. And certainly there's a push under Trump to reinvigorate it. But as Misha highlighted, Jeff Sessions, I think, did try for, to go for state marijuana legalization. I think he was stopped, probably with, within the White House, it appears that he was stopped from, from pursuing that. But when people in Morocco say, well, the UN says we can't legalize cannabis, say, well, what about Jamaica, Uruguay, Canada, the United States, the Netherlands, to some extent Spain and other parts of Europe, right? How come these guys can do it, but Morocco can't? And that's, that's I think, one thing that highlights is often the UN has been a kind of, oh, well, we don't want to address this because the UN says we can't, is a nice little deflection from not wanting to address a difficult political issue. But it is just about recognizing we're in a more fle flexible era of international drug policy. There's a more multipolar approach, as Misha highlighted, Russia is taking on a much more p powerful role relative to the US and others. But I don't think there's any real international obstacle to Morocco establishing a domestic cannabis market, not an export one, but a domestic market. 
Yeah, um, I don't think there's always an economic alternative. <laughs> yeah, I think when it was the piracy, there was one because it was it was marginally profitable, and policies could have been made at the time to give people an alternative, make them help them to build the infrastructure to trade. Even if it's people, people smuggling, that was one of the alternatives to piracy, but, 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 but nonetheless, um, there were communities within Somalia which preferred to trade um, within the greater Indian Ocean economy um, to piracy. I'm not so sure that that works with drugs. I have a PhD student who works on, uh, on the choices that coca farmer makes, and I can't really think of a crop that is more potentially more profitable though, than, than cocoa, and it costs <coughs> four times a year and pretty much immediately. And, and coffee will take eight years to produce the first bean and then it might not be very good. So. And in a place where no roads, people come to collect it from your farm. You don't have to bring it to market. Exactly, so, so, so I think sometimes it, there, there, there are economic <laughs> solutions, um, but very often I, I, I fear they're not. Pessimistic. <laughs> But thank you. I, I'm going to be more optimistic thank because you. I think there's a lot that development can bring to the table. So if we see military strategies as almost a cookie cutter approach, which I think the example of transferring the Somalia response to the Mediterranean is a good example, that what development brings is a really deep contextual understanding of the environment that they're working in. Uh, and in that sense, they can tailor the strategies to whichever context um, it's needed. And this could be anything from governance programming. So as Anya said, bringing back the state and creating these structures so that people aren't resorting to um, organized crime. It could be, as Misha said, creating a sewage system in the favelas so that there are um, services available for people. The problem is engaging with this as a response to organized crime, which there is still a serious reluctance um, from the development community to do, which I think is starting to shift um, because I think what they bring to the table is effectively a structural transformation of the factors that create a conducive environment for organized crime. Thank you. Uh, so essentially, when I was um, uh, talking to uh, Antonio Bonfin Lopez, Nema Pro Senior, he controlled the favela for five years. Uh, he was uh, from, uh, entirely on his, his own with his army from 2006 to 2011. When he was in control, homicide rates in uh, Hosinia dropped by uh, over three times so that it was actually lower than the homicide rate of Rio de Janeiro as a whole. He did this through three, um, three instruments. The first is uh, an uh, absolute control uh, over violence, a monopoly on violence within the favela. Uh, the second was uh, the systematic corruption of all police who patrolled around the favela so that not only did they not attack his operation in the favela but they acted as a first lookout system and things like that. Uh, he also corrupted other people, lawyers, uh, more senior policemen and so on. And then the third thing was the support of the community. Um, what he discovered by, uh, as a consequence of the lowering of homicide rates is Rossinia became one of the most popular favelas uh, in Rio. Uh, from 2007, there was a big tourist industry there. The, it, it was surrounded by three of the wealthiest areas of, in, of all Brazil, and uh, the middle class clientele, particularly the young people of those areas, were persuaded to come into the favela, buy their cocaine there, have an evening at the local club, and then be able to go home and have the frisson of cool, um, because most middle class people still see um, favelas as the gates of hell. Uh, and the, uh, so, so with the support from the community, with corrupting the police and with lowering homicide, <coughs> homicide rates, what happened is, is that the cocaine uh, industry uh, increased its turnover and it became the most profitable cocaine operation in Rio, responsible for s roughly 60% of Rio's turnover of cocaine. And with that, of course, he could uh, contribute further to the stabilization of the economy and the social situation. He developed a, an embryonic uh, welfare system. So that was actually using cocaine as the source 
of a, um, a virtuous circle as, a, uh, as opposed to uh, um, a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what that addresses is the issue of state, state substitution, and the responsibility of the state to address the fundamental issues of welfare of, uh, uh, of people who, are, uh, who live in, uh, in conditions like that. Thank you to all of our panel. Dr. Cochran, I'm going to turn it back to you, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, um, I, my own contribution to this is fairly limited, but uh, your last comment there, Misha, was very interesting. Some of you may or may not know that I lived in, uh, I lived in Belfast uh, for over 22 years. Uh, I arrived at the more or less the height of the Troubles in 72 and finally left when the peace process broke out, not because the peace process was breaking up. And I was kind of very interested in your comments there, really, Misha, about Favela and what happened. Actually, when the provisional IRA were at their height of influence uh, in the 70s and after the hunger strikes in 8081, they controlled their areas, and they controlled them very firmly, very firmly. Um, but interestingly, there was very little crime in West Belfast. Ordinary, decent criminals had not a chance. Moreover, uh, the provosts, as they were called romantically by some people, not me, uh, uh, actually waged their own war on crime very effectively. So therefore, there was very little criminality. Moreover, there was very little drug taking. Because drugs were seen as being anti-political, could be used as the provost or as a kind of used by the state to corrupt people and maybe even turn them into informers. When the peace process came about, by non-military means, let me point out, so there was no military end to the war in Northern Ireland in, in the Good Friday Agreement. It was negotiation, it was intelligence, it was drawing in government, development strategies and all the rest. Bill Clinton played his own role. When that came to an end and the Provo's lost a large degree of their control, crime and drugs returned to West Belfast. Now, I'm not saying that's a good argument for keeping the war going, in Northern Ireland for another 24 years. But it does take us into the complexities of thinking about solutions to these kinds of problems. Of course, military responses can work. I was thinking as I was listening to what our colleagues were saying, that if there's 175 German divisions coming towards you, as there were on the evening of June 20th and 21st of 1941, and that coming towards you with their panzers, well, there's a military solution, okay? I can get that. You're not going to sit around and think of the reasons for the rise of unemployment in 1929 <laughs> or 1930 or inflation in the Weimar Republic and have a discussion with the incoming 175 Nazi divisions. So let's be perfectly honest, military responses can work uh, and under certain circumstances, but only if the other guy is wearing a uniform. And the problem is, and I, I got much of this from tonight, most of the challenges we faced in the world do not wear uniforms. Um, criminals wear very good suits, actually. Um, some of the best dressed people in the world, I think, are criminals, and they wear some of the more expensive suits. Certainly not suits that could be worn and afforded by LSE professors, let me point out. <laughs> Moreover, as I think it came out tonight, uh, military uh, solutions may not even be solutions can make the situation work. And I think that came out very strongly this evening. Again, from my own Northern Ireland experience, uh, I, I can assure you the Provisional IRA were a pretty ruthless bunch of guys. I taught most of them once they'd done 15 years in, uh, in, uh, in the jug, as they say. Um, and many of them were the most intelligent people I've ever taught. Um, some of the best students. I gave more first to prove former provost, I think, than anybody else, I imagine. But one of the things which, now, when I used to ask them, I said, why did you join up? Oh, they said, because of a guy in the British Army kicked me around the head uh, or butted me, uh, or, or Bloody Sunday, uh, when the paramilitary <coughs> the Paris went into the city of Derry and shot 13 people, 14 people, ultimately died. That was a military solution. And what did that do? That created the IRA. Or it gave the IRA they didn't have enough guns to hand out to the volunteers who joined. So the idea that somehow or another there are military solutions to political problems and civil rights issues and all the rest, it seems to me, has been proven time and time and time again not to work, to make the situation altogether 
worse as it certainly did. And as I said in the end, what brought about the great Good Friday Agreement, it is a great agreement, uh, of 1997 and 1998, was not military. The military <coughs> didn't win. There was a negotiated settlement around agreed principles. And when you come to the issue of crime, it seems to me that militarization, which you've talked about this evening, it seems to me to be entirely irrelevant. Um, and what I've learned from this evening, that if, we, if we're going to deal with the issue which Misha, you, I, I must say, have written about most brilliantly, and when I read your book on the former war in Yugoslavia and how that had fed into organized crime on a scale you could never remember, you know, forget Godfather 1, 2, and 3. They were civilized gentlemen almost by comparison, much less organized, and by the way, much less global. And I think that's also what comes out of what we're talking about here. So the idea there is a war on crime strikes me as both banal and absurd and doesn't really address some of the key issues and the strengths and the respectability, and I think you bring this out very well as well, Misha, the respectability of so many criminals and how respectable they have come and have become over the many years and how to deal with that, it seems to me, is I, I think you know, one of the great challenges of our age. Because when organised crime on a global scale gets powerful with the money they have, they destabilise states. They undermine democracy, they destroy the rule of law, they corrupt, and they're doing it and they're continuing to do it, and not just in Mexico either, and not just in the South, they're also doing it in our own societies, uh, which we claim still to be uh, democratic. So the challenges are just huge. Anyway, it's been a fantastic evening. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, Tuesday, for your book. Let's hope the price comes down. Uh, <laughs> And I'd also like to thank uh, Misha, on behalf of the LSE, uh, for, for your contribution and for the work you've done over many years, highlighting things, let's be perfectly honest, which so many people in international relations don't talk about. You, you talk about the things, quite frankly, which we need to talk about far more. So I wonder if we could put our hands together again, say thank you.